Praise God. Come on, people of God, let's stretch our hands to Him and welcome the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come on, tell Him. Holy Spirit, we welcome You. Holy Spirit, we welcome You. Holy Spirit, change my life. Touch my heart. Holy Spirit, we welcome You. Father, as we open Your Word, speak to our hearts, Lord. Do something to shake us into a state of fire and revival. Lord, change us. Touch us, O oh God. It's in your powerful name we pray. And all of us say, Amen. We are on the fourth week, my gosh, of uh, the Hell series. And uh, today is going to be a much happier sermon. So you can heave a sigh of relief. Wonderful, right? Uh, the first week we did is hell real, and the second week we did uh, what is hell like. Last week, we spoke about the warnings Jesus gave. Now, last week was a very vital message because those are the warnings that Jesus gave uh, about hell. You say, Pastor, what are going to do this week? Well, this week, we're going to talk about way of escape from hell, okay? And then next week, we're talking about snatching people out of the fire. Okay, next week is really about speaking about the need to win the loss. All right, but today is going to be good because you say, Pastor, I've been hearing about hell sermon, and honestly, it seems very hopeless. Hell is so uh, tough to hear, and it's true. You know, um, I've had a few emails that came outside of our church. Uh, praise God, I think this message is going out, and I have people from uh, different churches writing to me. And one of the ladies actually uh, wrote this word to me. She said, Pastor, I've, I've been a Christian for many years. And basically her story is, she's not really heard about hell. And the series of the last few weeks of sermons kind of prompted her for urgency. For it's a real place. And even though, of course, churches don't want to talk about it so often because... We want to come and celebrate, of course, God's goodness. But we can't deny it's still a real place. Uh, you know, my wife and I were talking about hell just a few days ago, and she actually, uh, she's kind of starting to kind of transcribe a bit of it for me. And she went to Google and see how many books on hell are there. Right now in, in the Christian circuit, there's not many books on hell. Some of you can say praise God, but you need to understand that there's also no market for hell. What I mean is, uh, apart from maybe three to five notable books by famous Christian authors about hell, most people don't want to talk about it, don't want to think about it, and certainly don't want to buy books on hell. And I, I'm, I'm the same as you. Like, if you look at my library at home, uh, majority of my books are on Christian living, on theology, on the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you know, different historical aspects of the church. I don't really have many books on hell. Now, the truth is I... I, I bought some books on hell is because in response to this series that I'm teaching. But before this, I didn't really have books on hell. And I said, wow, it's so true. And if you check on Amazon, you would see that uh, books on hell are not sold much because who wants to read about hell? But yet also there's a part of me that says, you know how deceitful the enemy is? I'm not saying that we should like reading about hell. I'm saying that the, the enemy is so deceptive that the people of God that has the light and has the truth are not going into a subject that should put a deep urgency for prayer. A deep urgency is like a trumpet sound and a clarion call in the people of God that time is really short. Jesus is returning soon. The Antichrist is about to come. The world is going to a close and judgment day will definitively happen, and people are going to be sent to hell or brought to heaven. It's true. We can't run from it. Your Bible speaks of it from cover to cover. It is an absolute spiritual fact. But yet, though, the conversation of hell is messed up. I get it. I get it. 
Um, and it, in fact, before I wanted to preach this sermon, I spoke to one or two people, and one or two of them said, Pastor, you're very brave, you know. <laughs> you want to speak on hell? What if no one wants to come to church? I said, so be it, man. I, I can't help it, though. Honestly, the preaching of hell in the church should not be to terrify us of where we are going. If we are Christian, we should be trusting that God is leading us to heaven. But it should put a significant fear for the people that we love on our hearts, right? That they might not be going to heaven. It should put some level of apprehension and some level of desperation. You know, the, the, the funniest thing is this, okay? Before I get into the word, we do much more for our loved ones when they are sick or they have cancer or they have a life dilapidating disease but we do so little when it comes to their eternal destination. And I hope when you hear this, you don't feel guilt. It's not guilt that would bring conviction. It is a fact that we do much more. We are urgent as we bring them to the, to the hospitals, to the emergency rooms. But friend, it's time to sound the alarm. The biggest emergency that this world has to know, it's not what happens in this life. But what happens if you do not have Christ in your life, if you are not a follower of Jesus, the biggest tragedy, calamity that can happen to a person is when they die in this world a success, they go into hell completely devastated for all eternity. So how do we escape hell? I want you to really make sure that you send this sermon out to family and friends. Now, I'm so glad some of you have told me you have done that. Some of you texted me to say, Pastor, I'm sending out to as many people as I know. Do that, please. Why? Because it might be hard for you to talk about hell to people. I understand. You know, it's very strange to do that, right? So let me do it for you. Send it out. Say, my pastor said it. If you are angry, angry with Pastor Faces, okay? Don't get angry with me, you know? Uh, but I'm just sending out what was taught. And send it out. I'm okay getting anger. It's fine. Because I'd rather people be angry with me, but I sufficiently warn them about what God says, and in the hopes that we can win more to Christ. How do I truly really know I will escape hell? I'll write this down. And the only one simpler point is be a genuine follower of Christ. That's really the key thing. It's all about Jesus for sure. But you see what happens in the church globally is everyone says they're a believer of Jesus Christ. And yet we have seen the warnings. Last week we see the warnings Jesus had for the church itself. The church is full of people that are believers, either very lukewarm believers, very marginal believers, very conventional uh, and very sedated believers, or perhaps believers that are pursuing God and wanting to be on fire for Him and passionately falling after His will. See, the church is not a place where everyone definitively comes to church means that we're all going to heaven. I mean, I wish that was so, but the Lord showed me that wasn't so many years ago. It wasn't so. It isn't so. And so, look at the Bible verse now in uh, Matthew 13. We'll look at one quick parable here that Jesus gives. I want you to really see what he says, because I know the first objection you will have is this. You would assume that this parable is about unbelievers versus believers. Uh, no, it's not. Uh, this passage is about false believers versus true believers. Look at what it says. Again, verse 47, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. So look at what Jesus says. He says, you want to know what the kingdom of heaven is like? It's like a gospel net where the net is thrown out. Remember he said to uh, Peter and John, no longer will you fish for fish, but you will be fishers of men. So just put that in your mind and you see the gospel net being thrown out. The gospel net is this. Believe on Jesus Christ, he died for your sins. So it's thrown out and many people that respond would begin to come to church. But that doesn't end there though. It says, look at what it says. Verse 48, when it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good, the good fish, or the good uh, uh, things that they caught into containers, but threw out the bad. 
So within the gospel net, there's going to be good Christians and bad Christians. That's what it means. Uh, long ago, I used to think, wow, whew, this is about unbelievers and believers. No, it's not. It's about false believers and true believers of Jesus Christ. Are you a true believer of Jesus Christ? I hope you are, and I hope I am, right? We got to pursue this. Now, it says in verse 49, so it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw the evil, right, into the fairy furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is what Jesus said. True Christians and false Christians will be drawn in by the gospel net. They hear about Jesus dying for their sins, and of course, there's some level of joy, and they'll be drawn in. This parable is not different from many parables that Jesus gave. He gave the parable of the good soil, right? Good soil are true Christians. What about other grounds? Thorny ground. These are Christians that are false. Thorny ground, rocky ground, false. Only those on good soil, you would have fruits of righteousness that Jesus says 30, 60, 100 for. You are growing in the spirit of God. You're growing in his word. You are walking in the light. You are doing the works of God. And so when I was a younger Christian, that's where I started to see all these things. And I started to say, oh no, oh gosh, Jesus, I might not be a real Christian I know I come to church, I know I serve you, but I'm half-hearted. In one sense, I do love God. In another sense, I do love my sin. I do love my lifestyle. I do want to do sin. I, I want to do the things that the church says we shouldn't do. And of course, I want to do it in secret because who wants to be exposed? But I'm so glad the Word of God exposed me because the Word of God has to do that to show where we are. You see, friend, if you have right now secret sins, I'm not asking you to come to the front and you, you feel like you're being mocked at. That's not the heart at all. I'm telling you, those secret sins are not that secret in the eyes of God. It could be secret to your husband, to your wife, to your children. It could be secret to your parents, but it's not secret to God. God knows our sin. And you said, but pastor, Jesus died for my sin. Then Romans would say, how can you as a Christian still live in the very sin that Jesus died for? Which means what? You say, Pastor, I thought that the Christian, yeah, it means that if Jesus died for our sin, we cannot continue on in that pattern. We got to give it up. We have to say, God, I, I used to love sports more than you. I'm going to give up. I used to love women more than you. I'm going to give I used to love wine and booze more. I, I used to love money more than you, but now... I'm gonna give that up. I'm gonna give up the love of those things. That's why you can understand why in the Bible there's so many warnings. Otherwise, there's no need for warnings, friend. If it's simply going to heaven means that, do you believe in Jesus? I believe he died for my sin. And if that's all there is to the story, I can promise you the Bible is a very thin book. Because there's not much to say. It's just to tell us, you're a sinner, I'm a sinner. We need the grace of Christ. He died for our sin. That's about it. But that's not about it though. For those of you that have flipped through the Bible and at times you have your conscience pricked when you're in Galatians or, or Revelations or, or, or Ephesians or anywhere in the Bible and you saw a verse that you said, the Spirit of God seems to be talking to me and then you're hearing another whisper and that's the whisper of the enemy telling you, no, 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 it's fine. Cool down, calm down, it's okay. You already said the sinner's prayer. You are totally fine. You're a good fish. I'm telling you, friend, those are lies from the enemy. The Word of God is the place that brings to bear where we really need to go. If the Word of God is stinging at your conscience, it means that it's time to repent. Like you read certain things that the Bible says, there should not even be a hint of sexual immorality amongst God's people. It's in the Bible. But we are toying on the line. And we're flirting with this, whoa. And we're dancing with the wolves and we are carousing with the enemy and we are sipping wine with the devil. We are. 
And so, you know, I, I tell you honestly, from my own personal situation is I had to do different types of fasting in my own life. I had to fast from Netflix and YouTube so I don't get addicted. I had to fast from Instagram and Facebook so I don't get addicted. You know, you have to fast. For some of us, friend, hopefully this hell series would say, you know, I'm going to get serious with God. I don't want to be thrown out. I want to be a good fish. I don't want to be separated in a way that leads me to the fiery furnace. Now, I know if this concerns you, then this is what you need to do. Go back and begin a search for ways to debunk what I just said. Because that's what I did. I used to try to find a way to debunk the Bible. Like when Jesus said something difficult, I used to find a way to say, maybe that's not what he meant. I'm trying to read commentators and commentaries to try to support a very libertine, liber, uh, liberal life. And I could not find anything that substantiated what Jesus gave. Jesus warned about sin. Jesus warned about falsehood. Jesus warned about believers going down that rabbit trail. Jesus warned the seven churches in Asia Minor in the book of Revelations. He warns and he says, repent, place faith in me again. Turn from those things, otherwise I'll take away your right to be a church. I'll take away your right to be my people. I'll take away your right to follow me. Now, those are frightening things. You said, oh, pastor, I thought we were getting to the good... Th- uh, today is supposed to be happier. Okay, just give me five more minutes, we'll get to very happy things, okay? But still, these things make me fearful in a good way. To not take salvation lightly, to not take God lightly, and to look at my own life and say, Spirit of God, I need to finally deal with my pride, my anger, my irresponsible behavior. Whatever it is that you're struggling with, friend, please hear it from a heart of love. I'm not criticizing, I'm not condemning, I'm saying we need to give those things up. Just give it to God. Now let's get to what should I do to work up my salvation? So if the question is, am I a good fish or a bad fish? I tell you frankly, let's go into a list of things that can show how we're going to be a follower of Jesus, a true follower of Jesus. So what should I do to work on my salvation? I must say it again because I don't want to be labeled a false teacher. We cannot save ourselves. We don't have the power. We are sinful at a core. And our hearts is deception and wickedness. The Bible is clear that transgressions I know since I was born, things like that. I was wicked since the time of my mother's womb, things like that. So there's no way we can save ourselves. We definitively needed Christ to be our intercessor, our, our, our exchange for our sin. He had to come in and pay the price. So that's clear. But though, the Bible does say we have to work out our salvation, which means that is the right road to be a true follower. If you say, Pastor, I don't want to work out my salvation in fear and trembling, I'll be very frank in love. I fear for your soul. I fear what you will hear when you see God. I really do. Because you are not going against Pastor Pace's word. I did not say, work out your salvation and fear and trembling. It's not something that I quoted in a, a, a St. Saint, Saint Pacer chapter 1, verse 1. There's no, there's no book on my name. For the scripture that talks about working out, to walk out that faith. So the first thing, write this down, is pay close attention to the saving work of Christ. This is going to blow your mind. I, I, can, I can promise you that this is a lost teaching. This statement itself, pay close attention to the saving work of Christ, is a lost teaching. It's gone. It's gone everywhere, friends. You're not going to hear this. I, I'm, I'm not saying this for sensationalism, I'm telling you, you're not hearing this in the Baptists, you're not hearing this in the Anglicans much, you're not hearing this in the Methodists, you're not hearing this in charismatic Pentecostal circles, you're not hearing this, it's a lost teaching, but needs to be recovered. And you say, Pastor, is it your teaching? Absolutely not. It's found in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. Check it out, it says, how shall we escape, talking about the Christians, not the non-believers. The Hebrew writer says, how do you want to escape judgment? If we neglect such a great salvation, you know what the Hebrew writer is saying? God has done so much in the person of Jesus Christ. The salvation was so amazing. Why do you want to neglect it? 
And if you do neglect it, what are you truly saying to God? That, that God was so important. Let me give you an example in the Bible that really helped me, okay? At one stage, remember Goma married Hosea? Remember the story? I don't want to rehash the whole story, but the Bible actually shows us that Hosea is a type of Jesus. It's to showcase Jesus, and Goma is to showcase God's people, Israel. So hear the story, okay? So Hosea marries Goma. So far, so good, because Christ marries us, the church. And then, though, we see that Goma strays. Goma is unfaithful to Hosea. As the church of Jesus Christ, we can be unfaithful. The Bible uses terms like we prostitute ourselves to other gods. We are harlotans. We are harlots. Unpleasant language, very offensive, I understand, but no less the truth. What do we say, though, if we really put God in second, third, fourth position rather than the prime position he should be in our lives? What, what can we say? We give excuses like, you know, we struggle to love God, but let's face it, folks, it's we have denigrated God. <laughs> we have relegated him to something not so vital. That's the truth, no matter how you like it. We have always 24 hours in a day and we have competing passions, but we know how to prioritize in the way that comes from our heart. So if God is number one in our hearts, if he is, our money and our life and our blood will flow towards that direction. You know, when I was courting my wife, there were other ladies, but my wife was the one, right, for me. And so it was so easy to say, okay, I'm gonna put away all other distractions and focus on Catherine. That's the same picture of God, you see. So Goma cheats on Hosea, and then she's a harlot, and she prostitutes herself. It gets so bad that she's even on the sex table selling herself as a sex slave. And we look at Goma and we say, that's so disgusting. But we feel offended when Goma is us. We, we look and judge at Goma and get perturbed by her actions, but we fail to see that what if we are Goma? I'm not saying we are, but what if? And then the picture of God saying to Hosea, go and show love to your wife again, it's just something that, uh, you know, we can cry honestly. It's like, she doesn't deserve your love, Hosea. She has ran out on you and the children, she has, continue on in her wanton lifestyle, and then God, you say something so offensive to tell a prophet, no, a prophet. Imagine if there's a pastor in, in the land, a very famous pastor in Singapore, not me, I'm just saying, if there's some pastor in the land and you hear that famous pastor has a wife that became a prostitute, and that's really very painful to hear, very damaging and, 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 you know. By the way, it happened though in Israel. So it's the story of Hosea, it's on display for millions of Christians all around. So it did happen. But so let's say it happened in Singapore. And then we will be like, wow, this pastor is suffering. Wow. And then later on, in a few months time, we hear that this pastor brought the prostitute wife back home. Now, we can swing either one of two ways. One, we can see grace and love and forgiveness, or we can see how can Hosea accept her ever again? And you know what God said? I want you to bring back Goma. It's how I'm gonna to respond to my faithless people. And you know what it brings tears to my heart? because no matter how many times I've been a gomer to the true Hosea, God still gives me and us that space before we die, of course. He still gives us time, the Bible says, to repent. Repent is not this whole frightening thing. Repent is, this is what repentance looks like. Hosea is supposed to be my true north. I've turned from Hosea to love money and any other thing. 
And then repentance means I forsake these loves and I look back at Jose and I said, I'm sorry, my husband, I'm coming back. And no matter how many times you and I have been goma to God, while there's still breath and while there's still life and while you are not dead yet, the arms of Hosea still stretches out, welcoming us back. And if you see it from that angle, you cannot criticize God because the way we criticize Goma is actually the picture of a faithless, wayward church. You see how crazy this is? So sometimes when I read the Bible, when we start to see the different sides, like if we look from Gomer's standpoint, we look from Hosea's standpoint, it, it kind of paints a picture better. But when I just paint it to you, it's something not Pastor Pace's version of the text. It is God's version of the text. He said to Hosea that show love to your wife again, bring her back home the same way that I'm going to show love to my wayward people. It's God's words, not, not my words. So when I look at that portrait, I'm saying, wow, why do we want to leave God? Why do I relegate God to second or third or fourth place? Why can't I put him back in really the central locus of my life? God, help me. Because if I put you second, third, fourth place, I'm no different from a goma. So the Bible says, how should we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? If you focus on the escape, you will get fearful. If you focus on the great salvation, you will get hopeful. You say, what does it mean? When people talk about hell, they get frightened. But if you can talk about the wonderful side of heaven and Christ, you and I don't have to go to hell, but it's all about Jesus. You see the point? Hell is frightening if you are a false believer and an unbeliever. But it's not frightening if you truly want to follow Jesus because no longer hell is your destination, but you are heaven bound. You are on the road, that narrow door, and you are going to bring others along with you. Second point, write this down very quickly. Next one, living and trusting in God's promises. Now, this is huge, okay? We all understand this, but can I bring it something so relevant to you? You say, Pastor, I know that a true Christian will live and trust in God's promises. This is what living and trusting in God's promises is, meaning you have a spirit of joy, serenity, surrender, calmness, looking unto Christ. You are not frantic, worried, constantly panicking. That's not living in God's promise. That's not, I just want to let you know that's not the portrait of that. Jesus many times says to the disciples, E of little faith. He said something, they heard it, they begin to shift and get panicky, and Jesus has to call them back to faith. Faith means I trust in God's promises. Let me give you an example, okay? This is something that we all go through, but I want to show you how relevant it is. Please look at me for a minute. I, I, I'm, I'm a picture of you now, okay? Friend, I'm a picture of you. So let's say, Pastor Basil, I'm you now, okay? Okay, Lord, you said in your word, never will you leave me nor forsake me. I'm gonna stand right now in this locus, standing in the midst of trusting in that promise, that promise, just one single promise now, friend. One single promise, I will trust that you will never leave me nor forsake me. Then I see the enemy come. The hyenas, the wolves, the vultures come. And standing in this place of security, I begin to panic. Oh, Lord, you will never leave me nor forsake me, right? Questions. The vultures keep coming, the noise keep coming, cacophony ensues, war approaches, your heart is troubled. And then, if you're not careful, you begin to walk out from that place where you're the safest. In Christ, in the vessel, you can smile at the storm. Because why he's with you, right? Supposedly, but when we are shaky, you see, King Saul had that. He was shaky. I should trust in the promise that God gave to Prophet Samuel, but I did not, so I'm shaky because I see people making noise and therefore I shift my central north focus to what the people say rather than what God says. 
So I base my peace on what people say rather than what God says. You said, never will you leave me nor forsake you, Lord. I bank on that promise because there's no one else. There's no one else. My friend, I need you to have that. Because the day will come, though, and we all understand this. You know, these last few months, I've been having breathlessness, and I, I'm going to get it checked out. Don't worry, I'm okay. Pray for me, but I'm okay. But I tell honestly, there were times when I'm getting lightheaded, and I'm thinking, okay, Lord, this might be the last day, you know. Lord, please uh, be with my wife and my children and be with Lighthouse, you know. Like, Lord, this could be it, no? I, and then the security is, Lord, I, I want to be found in your presence. It's not simply about heaven. It's about the presence of God. It's about who you are. And I tell honestly, because of the breathlessness these few months, I, there's an urgency, like I'm, I'm only 44, and in my mind, I shouldn't die at 44. But many people have died at 14, 24, 34. I don't know when's my last breath. I don't think it's my last breath yet. I have much to do. I have sensed what God has been telling me to do. I've sensed what the Spirit of God told me I have to do for, for our church and this land. I've, I kind of know that, but then again, I'm not God, so... He could say, you know, son, it's your last day. He could say that. He could say that at any time. Would I trust and still stand in the midst of his promise? This is where his promise is. Stand there and say, you said, Lord, you would never leave me nor forsake me. And you know, we have in the Bible stories, genuine people that understood that. The Daniels. I tell you, you want to know what loneliness is? To be taken from your home and brought to a foreign land as a slave and a captive, not knowing anyone, not knowing the language, looking at strange customs, and yet doggedly standing upon God's word. And even though a decree was made, if you pray to anyone else except the king, the person will be thrown into the lion's den. And Daniel still continue his practice. He did not hide behind closed doors or windows. Do you know what the Bible says in Daniel? He still went back home. He heard the decree. His heart was troubled. He went back home. He did as he did customarily, opened up his windows, knelt down. He was in that space. And they put him and threw him into the lion's den. I want you to see Daniel for a minute. Never will you leave me nor forsake me. And as he stood in the den of a hungry, ravenous lions, he could have died. The three Hebrew boys said it best. You know what, king, if you throw us into the fire, we won't die. But even if we should die, we still worship Yahweh. Standing in that place of complete surrender and rest and peace to the one true God. That's what a true Christian is. Where else can we go, Peter said. You have the words of life and death. Where else can we go? I can imagine Daniel in the flesh looking at the lions terrified out of his wits, but again trusting that God, you are with me. You're with me. If I should be eaten, I'll be in your presence, but I know you can stop the mouth of lions and you stand on the promise. Too many of us are trusting in the prayers of a pastor. Trust not in the pastor, friend. Trust in the promises that Jesus has given you. And if we can do that, we can begin to take authority. You say how? Start today. You know, there was this great statement that I heard. It was so amazing. I can't remember the, the person, but this great man of God was praying over Scotland. And he declared to God in his own prayers. He said, give me Scotland for Christ's sake or I die. He's believing and saying, I'm going to trust. The same, you can take authority now. If you say you're a Christian, take authority. Stand in the place of where the enemy is coming and take authority over your children and your children's children and your household and plead the blood of Christ over your doorposts of your heart and life. You can do it, friend. You can hold on to that or you can decide to shake, to be a king's saw, to run from the promise to be faltering in hope, to lose the confidence of God, to be dropping sleep, to lose that conscience of the presence of God. You can, but I tell you, isn't it better to be a Daniel 
when you hear that legislation wants your head and wants to put your neck on the gallows and wants to throw into the den of lions and you can stand and open the door and say, I'm still praying. I'm still seeking the face of God. And I'm still standing in the locus of his promise. Has what I said offended you or stirred you? I don't know what to expect. But when I look at them, I'm saying, God, I want to have that kind of faith because in of myself, Pesa is a weak, very weak man. But God, if I can look at your promise, if I can see what you're saying, and I hold on to that, there's no fear. Look at what it says in 2 Peter 1, 4, very quickly. By which he has granted to us, look at the words, look at the words, his precious and very great. Remember the first point was great salvation. Now the second point is to see great promises. Now look at me for a minute. You got to hear this, okay? If you think that God's promises are not great, that's why you fear. That's the truth, okay? I just want to leave it plain to you. For too long, for too long, in the Christian world around the world, preachers have been coddling the sheep in fear that the sheep leave the congregation. And preachers have made it seem like everyone else is at fault. Your mom-in-law is at fault, your dad-in-law is at fault, culture's at fault, philosophy's at fault, this world is at fault, the enemy's at fault, Lucifer's at fault. But for too long, preachers have not said, you know what? Your family, your responsibility, your country, your responsibility, your life, your responsibility. Are you gonna stand upon the great promises of Christ or are you gonna stand in the midst of the great enemy, so-called great enemy? If Satan is a roaring lion that makes a lot of sound but doesn't have true power, and that's why we fear because of the roar, we have to believe in that still small place God, you have great promises. I'm gonna stand upon your great promise. Oh God, you know, I'm gonna fear. I'm panicking. Lord, you know, I fear. Lord, you know, I'm shaky like a leaf in the wind. You know how quick I die inside, but quicken my spirit and help me to place my faith in your, what the Bible says? What did Peter says? This was a guy that got beheaded, by the way. Sorry, not beheaded. Uh, Peter was hung upside down at the cross. He died crucified upside down. You have great promise. Did you think that Peter was thinking that God's promise was not great when he was crucified? Or the promises of God had failed when the prophets were sawn in half, as the Bible said. Let's get to point C. Two more points and we'll pray. I think we have to have an order call today. Point C, obedience to Christ's words. This is big, okay? Friend, listen closely. Before you label me a legalist, I'm not a legalist. I really despise legalism. But you gotta hear me on this, okay? Obedience to God is central proof that you and I are truly following God. You can't run from that. I know there's a lot of popular teachings that are changing that. I'm gonna give you some logical standpoint. I'm gonna give you some logical standpoint, okay? Let's say I'm your close friend, and you say, Pastor Pesa, I love you a lot. And then after you say, Pastor Pesa, I love you a lot, then you give me a tight slap, And I'm like, poo, wow, very powerful your slap. Why was that for? Okay, uh, Pastor, I'm not gonna listen to you. I'm not gonna worship God, I'm not gonna come for, you know, I'm not gonna do anything you ask me to do. You give me a big slap across my face, let's say. And I say, you shouldn't do that, right? You should be walking with me, I'm your pastor, we should be loving one another, you should be obeying me, as your Bible says, the word of God says, obey your leaders for they keep watch over your souls and they have to give an account for your souls on that day of reckoning, that's what the Bible says. So why did you slap me? And if I say, do you love me? Yeah, but pastor, I love you, don't worry about the slap. You slap me again. I say, whoa, why do you slap me? What, what, what did I do? Shouldn't you? And they say, no, I slap you again, Pastor. I hope you see that you're not slapping me, though. I hope you're seeing that we're slapping God's word. Well, we don't obey. We're saying God's word, 
Lord, your word is not that premium and not that central in my life. And what are the excuses we use? Oh, Satan made me do it. But the Bible does say in many places that we have the power of the Spirit of God to overcome. It does. Look at what it says uh, in Hebrews 12, 25. Check out what the Hebrew writer says. He says, see that you do not, talking to the Christian, refuse Christ who is speaking. Look at what it says next. For if they did not escape when they refused God who warned them on earth, how much less will we escape if we reject Jesus who wants from heaven? Do I need to preach on this or can we just grasp this quick? Look at the screen, read it on your own time, see that I did not plagiarize or change the meaning or marginalize the text. Look at the verse yourself. I'll give you one minute, look at the text. Look at the warning that God gives us. Look at it. Do not refuse who is speaking. Do you see the text? How can we escape judgment if we refuse the words of Christ, if we refuse to obey? You know what Jesus said to the disciples? If you love me, you will obey me. So what is he saying the opposite? If you don't love me, you will disobey. Why did King Saul disobey? At the core of it, no love for God. Why did Samuel obey even at the potential cost of his life? He loved God. Why did ultimately David obey, apart from some sin, but we see David obey? He loved God. Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey me. But when we slap the word out, we are slapping his face. We are, friend. We are telling God, you are not worthy to be loved and you are not respected enough in my life to obey, and I will still live out my passion my way. You know what's a false Christian? A false Christian is this. Lord, I have an agenda for my life, and I pray everything that you fit my agenda rather than my agenda fits yours. A false Christian is all about your schedule, your calendar, your wants, your needs, and God is a prop to give you what you want, truth. Friend, I want to love you enough, even if you hate me after this, I want to love you enough to tell you the truth. What is a true Christian? Even if God slays me or leads me to the lion's den or throws me in a cauldron of fire, even if the Lord leads me to the cross to die like Peter did or leads me to be sown in half, even if the Lord leads me to a dungeon or the Lord leads me to be punished or the Lord leads me to be like John the Baptist, beheaded. Do you know John the Baptist was beheaded because he was obedient? Do you know that? His head would stay intact if he refused to obey. But he obeyed and his head was chopped off. It's in the Bible, it's in the Gospels. When you obey, you know, if Jesus didn't have to obey, he didn't go to the cross, right? He obeyed, remember the, the struggle he had, remember? What did he say finally? Look at the words he said. How do we know that Jesus loved the Father? Not my will. What's my will? Not to go to the cross. What's his will for us? To deny ourselves, take off the cross and follow him. See the point? Even Jesus struggled, but at the end, Jesus gave way to love. I want you to see that picture. He struggled. So if you say, Pastor, you don't empathize with my struggle, I tell you Jesus empathizes with our struggles. But please not, make no mistake about it. Still struggle all you need to, but obedience is still necessary. Obedience doesn't save us, but obedience proves that we are safe. Obedience proves that we're in love with God. Obedience proves that we're walking in the light as Christ is in the light. Can I say this to you right now? I've said this before over the years, but now maybe you are hearing it with urgency. Some of you are not meant to be in Singapore. Some of you, the Lord has called you to the mission field and you have disobeyed. I'm not saying go and represent Lighthouse. I'm not talking about a big brand name. I'm not saying be a, a, a person under Pastor Face or, or one of the pastors. I'm saying you have not obeyed the word of the Lord. You have not gone where God has called you to go. 
And it's time, friend. There's still time, though. There's still time. Like Jonah, you refuse your first missionary journey, and then the Lord still can arrest your attention. You say, Pastor, does God need to put me in a fish? Hopefully not, okay? <laughs> hopefully this sermon right now can do it. Instead of you being put in a fish for three days, hopefully through this sermon, the Spirit of God might be whispering to some of you, it's time to honor what you vowed to me. It's time to obey what you said you would. It's time to remember that statement I gave you when you were 18 years old. It's time to recall on bended knees how you felt when I called you out to Indonesia, to Malaysia, to China, to the nations. It's time. It's time. Do you recall, son? Do you recall, daughter, how I drew you in my presence, how I cleaned you up, how I prepared a home for you, how I led you into a community? Do you remember that moment when my presence was before you? Do you remember your vow you made to me? I don't know who this is for. Again, please don't feel condemned, but I'm telling you there are some Jonas in the house. And for some of you, the Lord is calling you back and you might say, but I'm not worthy. Do you see how beautiful God is? Jonah was not worthy, he disobeyed. But don't have to question God. God can even prepare the unprepared. He can qualify the unqualified. He can equip the ill-equipped. He can definitely forgive the rebellion that we've had, but we have to go to him. Father, forgive me for being a Jonah. It's time, send me now to the nations. Send me now for some of us. For some of you, I, I'm gonna say it out. Can I say this out? You might get angry, send me an email, it's all right. You're supposed to sell your business. You were supposed to sell your business and help refugees and help people that are in need of help and help lost ones and help orphans and widows. You were supposed to do that. The Lord put something in your heart and you shook off that conviction. You felt convicted for a few months and then you shook it off. You took it out like a wet blanket. You said, it's not gonna dampen where I'm gonna go. I'm gonna tell you, friend, it's not too late. It's not too late. I'm not, I don't know who I'm speaking with. I'm just telling you, I know it's a fact. I know in this house, Tempani's Woodlands, those of you who are watching online, I know it's a fact the Lord has spoken to some of us here, sell your business and begin to work with poverty-stricken people. Go to the third one nation, help the poor, show my love, the father's love to the fatherless, to the weak, to the orphans, to the... And some of you need to hear that now. And you need to go. You need to do it, friend. Pastor, if I don't do it, will I go to heaven? I have no idea. That's between you and God. I'm telling you though, you, you and I will miss out on what the promise of God means if we do not obey. Imagine if Abraham stayed put and refused to leave his hometown. Imagine if Jesus refused to walk to the cross. Imagine if Daniel was a weasel and a coward and refused to pray, I'm gonna die, I don't wanna die, I don't wanna die. He closed the door, he shut his heart to God. Imagine that we won't have the beautiful Lion's Den story to show us that someone that is anointed by God and wanting the presence of God can stand in the mouth of lions. Friend, we are very late now. We are so late. We are closing in on the world. And my Bible, your Bible reads the calamities that is to come. The devastation that will be poured out, God's wrath upon the world, safe for the saints call to prayer and fasting and perseverance. Safe for the bridegroom call on the bride to be ready to wear white and be prepared. And I tell you something else. Some of us here feel that call again. I'm not saying to everyone, I'm saying to some of us, for some of us, we feel that call again. We say, God, I, I actually want to be used in my time left. You know what, even friend, if you're 70, 80 years old, please don't look down on your age. There's still something you've got to give. And the Lord is calling you to that. And we'll get to the last point. Overcome temptation by God's power and we'll pray. Very quick. Overcome temptation by God's power. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Check it out what it says. No temptation has overtaken you. Pastor, I want to put Jesus first, but temptations are pulling me away. It's true, but yet, look at the promise of God. There's no temptation that will be greater 
you have to trust God that you can be put away from those temptations. The reason why we go back to those temptations is honestly, we love it more than God. I just want to be very candid and blunt. We love money, sex, entertainment more than Christ. We've got to give it up. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to men. God is faithful. See, if we say that, Pastor, this temptation is bigger than God's presence, then you are calling God faithless. <laughs> it's there. God is faithful, and He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, right? But with the temptation, He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Pastor, Delilah is coming, and like, I'm Samson. I can defeat the Philistine army, but when I see this beautiful woman, my, I'm weak in the knees, and I am going to go to her. And what the Bible says is this, God has also given you a way of escape, meaning at the heat and the height of temptation is also the place where the Spirit of God is vying for your attention. Before someone murders, before someone does a, a crazy atrocity, the conscience speaks. When the conscience is blunted, mass murdering ensues, genocide and Zeus, all the despicable things that we've seen in world history that we'll vomit and gag when we see the pictures of Vogue and Zeus, it really does. Because the person has lost humanity at the root of his heart. He has trapped and pushed away the voice of God, even if he's not a Christian. But what happens when a Christian is losing the place of God in his life is like Judas. He was hearing and seeing the popularity of Jesus and he was seeing that money is coming in. People are sending in money from all over the place to support the ministry of Jesus. And sooner or later, he looked at the money, he compared the calling that Jesus gave to him versus the promise that money gave to him. And he chose money. It's in the Bible. And Satan entered Judas. At a definitive point, if we don't choose Christ, Satan takes reign in a Christian's life. I'm not saying a Christian can be demon possessed, I'm saying that you are no longer working on behalf of God the glorious, you are now an emissary of the enemy. Is there no wonder where we see the churches of the world today, we're seeing crazy things in the church as in the world? Because friends, believe it or not, there are hundreds and thousands of Judases all around the global church. This is not to frighten you, this is to tell you, be on your guard, be alert. The Bible does say be vigilant, be on watch. Don't go to those situations. Be somber-minded. These are all biblical terms. Be vigilant. Why? The enemy wants to put us at sleep. The enemy wants to put us at bay. The enemy wants to close our lips of praise. The enemy wants to close our hearts to pray. The enemy wants to put our knees instead of bending down towards the heavens and trusting the God to move. The enemy wants to cut us off at the knees, cut us off at the feet so we have no power to tread over serpent and walk to any place that God wants us to walk. All true. I hope I've not said anything to offend you. What I want to do though is push you somewhere is to challenge you and I somewhere. I, I, I'm gonna close now. Now, hear me on this, okay? I've given you four points. You said, Pastor, I, I, I can't really grasp everything you said. It's okay. Later on during the week, replay this sermon again. Sit in a position where you say, God, Pastor Pacer sounds like a madman, but it's either he's mad for you or he's mad. I wanna see which is which. Sit down, hear this sermon again. In a, in a position where you are hearing God. Put out all your handphones, everything else. Listen to this sermon again and ask the question, is God speaking to you? Is God calling you now, now at a critical time in world history to stand for Him, to walk with Him, to trust in Him, to obey His voice, to overcome the snares of the enemy and to do what He has called you to do? You say, Pastor, I want to do all that, praise God. But here's the problem, Pastor. Every time I want to move ahead, I feel like there's an obstacle. I feel like Satan is very good at putting traps. And I can, I, can, I, can I share with you, now, can I talk as Pastor Tan, not your pastor for a minute? I've, I've seen that in my life, friend. Every time I'm, I'm making headway, 
the enemy throws something in my family's health. When I say there's spiritual attacks, some of you might sound, I think it's strange. I've never had spiritual attacks before I took on senior leadership, never. Because honestly, I was doing nothing for the Lord. But the minute that I'm stepping into senior leadership, all hell breaks loose, honestly. And I'm not talking about normal things, I'm talking about weird spiritual things. Even I have no doubt that this breathlessness is not from God, it's, it's, it's an enemy thing, right? So what happens if I lose my breath? I don't have the strength, or I feel like I can't come on a pulpit, I can't address all of you, I can't share my heart, I can't tell you the burden of the Lord, I, right? I, the, the very thing that I need to preach is the very thing that the enemy wants to take. I love my family and so, there's this statement that came to me that was the enemy's fear. The enemy's fear is this. Pacer, if you keep on going forward, I, I will destroy your enemy. I will destroy your family. And you need to understand that I can decide. Will I take authority? Can I, can I make this declaration to you? I'm gonna take authority. These are lies from the enemy. These are attacks from the evil one so that we don't do anything for the Lord. And we are gonna all frankly, guys, I tell you what's the worst thing. You know, Leonard Ravenhill has this great statement that I love. He said, five minutes when we all reach heaven, we would wish we pleaded, we prayed, we shared, we gave, we were generous, we evangelized. <laughs> we, 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 would, we would miss out the chance when we had on earth to do something viable, something pure, something right for the Lord but we missed that chance. And I tell you, friend, I, I, I'm 44 this year. I, I, don't, I don't want to miss that chance anymore. It's all out. It's all out of nothing, folks. It's either we go for the Lord or we die, okay? Sorry I said a happier sermon, I'm sorry about this. But I, I tell, <laughs> there, are, there are many souls dying, friends. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and we are, we are so content, we are so content <laughs> to play church. Oh God, forgive us. Forgive us, oh God, forgive me, Lord. <laughs> God, Jesus. <laughs> happier sermon, happier sermon, guys, is there's a joy of the Lord. Happiest sermon is that for those of us that will follow the Lord, there is bliss and the Bible promises the heaven's rewards are there, there's joy. But you know why Jesus wept when he saw the state of Jerusalem? He's, he cried, the Bible actually said he cried. He, he said, how I wish I could bring you like a mother hen brings his chicks. And then we saw how Jerusalem responded to him, right? They, they killed him, friends. They, they don't want the love of God in that way. You know, friends, the greatest opposition we have, honestly, I just tell you, one of the greatest opposition we have is laziness. We are not spending time pursuing the things that God wants. And, and uh, friend, please don't hear guilt. Hear conviction, okay? And, uh, let, let me say this and then we'll call a time to pray. But I, I don't think I can pray. Maybe um, Pastor Sam, would you mind taking over for just, just to pray? But friend, hear me on this very quick. When we reach heaven's shores and we see the wonder of heaven, and you know the Bible says in Hebrews that we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, right? So great. And we see what's happening on earth we get a glimpse into the chasm, into hell. Remember, Abraham could see into hell. Abraham had a conversation with the rich man in hell. And we, and we, I tell you honestly, that's the reason why the Bible says that God has to wipe the tears from our eyes when we go to heaven. Because on one hand, we are so glad we are there with him. 
out of this body into the presence of God forever. But another sense, we look into earth and we say, so many people not making it. So many people not going to find Christ. So many people, and then we will look at our lives and we will say, what was I doing for my 80 years? What was I doing? I did exactly what everyone else did, except I had Jesus, right? I, I, I grew, I studied, I, I worked, I had children, I had grandchildren. I said goodbye to them on my deathbed. I, I handed out my will and I prayed a prayer over them and that's it, I'm in the presence of God. But what if your life and mine can actually count for something? Now, like actually count for something now. The greatest thing you can do is not to lead someone to a promotion or bring a child into this world. Though those are wonderful things. The greatest thing we can do is to usher people into the kingdom of God. We can share the gospel and bring our families and loved ones. I know there's persecution. I know there's hindrance. I know people will call you a Jesus freak. I, I, you count a cost. You count a cost, you know there's a cost. I show you one last picture, Ken. I, 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 it just came on me. You know, when, when me and my wife were having our, our race and rainbow, I mean, honestly, no one prepared me for fatherhood, right? I mean, no one, none of my uh, peers, none of my uh, brothers who are fathers felt prepared. All of them said the same thing. You know, it's very cute, like the way we text. One of them would say, bro, it's super strong. Eh? You know, I, said, yeah. I said, I didn't expect that a baby would eat so much every day, like, you know. And then, well, go diaper, poop, 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 diaper, eat, 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 sleep, sleep, sleep. Oh, I'm like, oh, craziness, right? But you know, there's a joy and satisfaction to, to seeing your child grow, to, to seeing hopefully what the Lord has for them. It's the same when you talk about the hard work and the sacrifice for the Lord. You say, Pastor, if I share the gospel with people, I'm going to lose some friends. Some people are going to avoid me. I might lose some business, you know, because... I've tried to make it such that when in the, in the business world, people know me as the savvy business investor, but I try not to play my card that I'm a Christian. And I'm going to tell you now, I hope you hear it with the right spirit. Show your card. Now. Before you reach heaven and you said, why did I try to gain another 10 million for my business when I'm seeing thousands die? Show your cut now. I'm a Christian. Lose some friends if you need to. I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. Doesn't matter. You don't have to say you're from Lighthouse. That's not even the point though. You see the point? See, this, this could happen in the church world where there's politics and church wars or who's the greatest church. Who cares who has the greatest church when the world is going to hell? Who cares? It's time though. Show your cut. I'm a taxi driver for Jesus. I'm a chef for Jesus. I'm a homemaker for Jesus. I'm a designer for Jesus. I'm an architect for Jesus. I'm someone that builds stuff for Jesus. I, I'm a plumber for Jesus. I, I am. I'm going to show Christ. I'm going to share Christ. I'm going to do it. God, give me the strength. Oh no, if I tell this person I'm, I love Jesus, this person is not going to like me. I count a cost. I will be. Help me. God, I want to share and you know the faster friends we can reach people for Jesus you say but pastor it takes a long time for people to change I know it took a long time for you to change it took a long time for me to change so it takes time you're going to talk to the most hardened of people that will hate you that will hate your guts but you keep pursuing and you see the love of God beginning to drop 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 drip 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 drop 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 drip drip until one day you'll be so surprised that the most hardened hearts can turn around. They are flourishing. They are being watered like a plant that is receiving streams of living water. But if you say, Pastor, I'm going to hold the streams of living water for me and my family, do you know what happens with a stream that refuses to move? It becomes the Dead Sea. Stream must be given out so that you are replenished in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. I have to call an autocall. I said, okay, I, you don't have to come if you don't want to come. But can we all stand in Tempe's Woodlands? And Pastor Sam, do you mind helping me? Do you mind helping me? Now, friend, thanks, thanks, uh, David. Right now, the floor is open, and, and this is a specific thing. I'm not calling you to come out to pray over your sin, so no one feel embarrassed. I'm, I'm calling those of you that you know that God is stirring you 
to action. And you say, God, I want to live for you now. And I want to I have a new sense of your strength and your anointing to win more people for Jesus. Okay, the floor is open. Those of you that want to come out, Tampanese Woodlands, come right out and Pastor Sam will lead us into prayer. Those of you that are ready, just come, 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 come. And when you kneel down together with me, Just gonna wait just one minute. All right, in the next 60 seconds, we will start to pray. Today, what you what you have heard this message is a message of deep conviction. I want to appeal to all of us I'm included that we do not let this moment go this is a defining moment for many of us and you are ready let's pray precious Heavenly Father we thank you Lord we thank you for what you have spoken to us today, O oh Lord. May your words pierce through every hardness in our hearts today. May your words convict the sleepy giant that has laid down for too long. Lord, may your words that is so powerful Burn away all the dross that is within us, Lord. Lord, this is a call to every Christian, to every believer, to every lighter, to every husband, every wife, every father, mother, son, daughter. Every one of us is included. There is no escaping. Today, this message of love that was spoken to all of us. Lord, we pray that you will invoke in us, O oh Lord, that deep desire and passion to turn away once and for all. Lord, we know temptations will come, but Lord, your grace is more than enough, Lord. Lord, we will turn to you every time whenever there is a challenge from the devil. Lord, we will turn to you. We will choose you. Lord, today, strengthen these feeble arms and legs and help us, O oh Lord, to truly, truly steal our spine, our spiritual spine, O oh Lord, to run with you, to cooperate with you, to open up every single compartment of our, our hearts, oh Lord. Lord, we want to hold back nothing today. We invite you to come into every part of our hearts, the darkest parts, the, the most wicked ones. Lord, help us, oh Lord. Cleanse us, oh Lord. Grip our heart today. Not let it go. Lord, as your people today turn to you, as your people today open up our hearts to you, dear Heavenly Father, we know you see who we are, Lord. You see every soul that is open to you. Lord, we pray, Lord, that may you pour upon every one of us, O oh Lord, who is open to you, pour until we cannot contain any longer. Lord, birth in us that deep desire, passion to want to reach out to those who are lost, to those who do not know you, to those who are trapped, to those who are trapped in depression. 
those who are trapped in deep, dark addiction. Lord, set them free, O Lord. Lord, we are your hands and legs, your mouth, your ears, your instrument. You can freely use us, O Lord. Today, let us be changed and become ambassador for you and for your glory, O Lord. Lord, raise all of us up today, O Lord, and become evangelists, become pastors, to become your instruments of grace everywhere we go. Lord, strengthen us today. And we want to return to you, Lord. And we want to call you Abba, Father, as we are all your children. Lord, we pray that you will, you will continue, Lord, this journey with us as we surrender our lives with you. We know you'll be faithful. Jesus, you said that I will be with you till the end of time. Lord, you are not a man that you would lie. Lord, therefore today, Lord, we will cooperate with you. We will have this agreement, this covenant with you, O Lord, that we will walk with you and we will listen and obey your words and let our lives be changed from this point till we see you face to face. And all God's people say, Amen. 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 One, one statement, friends, uh, before Pastor Sam gives us a closing benediction. Next week, we are going to be speaking about ways to snatch people out of the fire. I really am asking you as your brother, as your pastor, find a way to bring someone along, really. Okay, because we're going to trust that the Spirit of God will move and just touch their hearts and instantly they're going to believe, okay? I, I don't know how it's going to be done. I know the Holy Spirit can do that. Can I say one last statement to you? We will see Singapore safe, amen. We will see our household safe. We will see our friends come to Christ. All for the glory of Jesus. Come on, give the Lord praise in this place.